Right, good afternoon everybody and welcome to the first of today's two meetings of the Customer and Corporate Services and Scrutiny Management Committee. Um, I'm going to just give us a brief overview of how the meeting is going to work today and then dive straight into business. Um, so members will be very familiar now that um, these meetings are being webcast. Uh, that means making sure you stay in shot at all times. Don't answer that phone. Don't go to the door for the delivery. I want to see you here front and centre throughout the meeting. Um, and uh, if you're wanting to participate in the meeting, um, the way to do so is to raise your hand in the Zoom uh, function. That's the blue hand button. Uh, if you want to ask any questions, and I will bring you in. Um, if you're wanting to ask an additional uh, question or supplementary question uh, on the specific item that's being discussed, then uh, wave your hand and I will uh, keep an eye out for that and bring you in uh, as I can. Um, we're going to be joined throughout uh, today's meeting by Janie Berry, who is the head of uh, uh, sorry, the Director of Governance and the Monitoring Officer, and Dawn Steele, who is the Head of Civic and Democratic Services. Uh, and then there will be various other participants coming into the meeting uh, as and when uh, we reach the items that they are joining us for on the agenda. Um, I do plan to take a short adjournment around about the halfway stage, just to give everybody's uh, eyes a rest. Um, but uh, beyond that, we'll move into the main bits of the business. Um, Apologies, I've just received uh, the one apology uh, this afternoon for Councillor Stuart Barnes, who is being substituted by Councillor Kilbane. Uh, on to the substantive items then. Uh, item one is declarations of interest. Uh, do any members wish to declare any interest in relation to this, uh, this afternoon's agenda? Uh, Councillor Mason. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to confirm things that are on my um, register of interest. So my wife works at the uh, university as part of the security team. So obviously heavily involved in their COVID stuff. And uh, I manage health services at St. Peter's. So in terms of kind of what's going on with schools and things, obviously having a lot of contact with people like Nick and, and Anita. So just to make that clear. Thank you very much. And Councillor Rowley. Thanks, Chair. Again, I'm sure it has absolutely no bearing, but just to for transparency, I am a school governor at um, uh, the uh, um, at a primary school in the city and also at um, Archbishop Holgate School as well. Thanks, Councillor Rowley. Um, and uh, I'll follow you that by, by noting that I'm also a governor at a primary school in the city as well. Um, so without anybody else indicating, I shall move us on to agenda item two, which is the minutes. Um, we've actually got two sets of minutes that we need to sign off today. So um, first, I'd like to look at uh, the minutes uh, for the meeting that we held at 2 p.m. on the 7th of September. Um, I've just got one thing that I would like to amend in the minutes. So while you're all having a think about anything that you wish to amend, I shall just raise it. Um, so it's at minute 21. Uh, in the paragraph that follows the resolve, uh, it says, uh, expressing his disappointment that there was now no Green Party representative on the committee. Uh, and actually, my disappointment was the disproportionate number of Lib Dem members on the committee as a result of the Green member having been removed from the committee. So I'd like to just make sure that that's reflected in the minutes. Other than that, though, I'm happy to sign them as an accurate record. So unless anybody else has anything they wish to raise, uh, Councillor Kilbane. Um, I have uh, sent a note to the uh, democracy officer already, but um, I'm down as apologies for that meeting, but I was actually uh, here and available, but uh, un an unneeded sub um, at that meeting. So uh, just for the record. Thanks, Councillor Kilbane. So other than those two amendments, I will sign those minutes as and when I get myself uh, a physical copy and, and as I said the other day I, uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm going to have a, a tome of, uh, of minutes to sign and so to add uh, even more to that if I move us on to uh, the minutes of the meeting held on the 16th of September and that was the if you recall the additional uh, meeting of CSMC that we held to discuss the government's uh, proposed changes to the planning system um, so again if uh, anybody has anything that they wish to amend otherwise I will sign those as an accurate record. Yeah, looking that nobody's got anything to add, so I shall sign that as well. And so I then move us on to agenda item four, which is the uh, Director of Public Health's update. So if I could ask Sharon Stoltz to join us in the meeting now. Um, Sharon is York's Director of Public Health. And as I think we've done uh, every month for the last few months, uh, what we'll ask for is a, a kind of an overview update of, of where things are currently. And then I'll invite members to ask any questions that they uh, may, may have. So uh, over to you, Sharon. 
Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to start um, this time by explaining what's happened with um, the number of cases. Um, some members of the committee may have read this in the national media, but um, there's been um, a, a significant number of backdated cases added to the um, uh, Public Health England database over the weekend. Um, and, and this is because of some difficulties with the national um, uh, communication between um, Test and Trace and the Public Health England database. The impact of that for York is that our um, provisional rate of new cases of COVID over the last seven days has um, massively increased to 114.43 per 100,000 population. Um, and, and, and that's largely that massive jump is because of this backlog of cases being added. Um, our validated seven day rate, so that's the confirmed rate, is 79.6. That is still an increasing number compared to um, numbers that I've shared with you before. Um, it's um, uh, above the national rate, which is 67.9, but below the regional rate, which is 102.7. So we've already had a media request this morning to clarify why um, the numbers have increased. What I expect will happen is that now that that um, error in the data system has been fixed, that over the last, over the next seven days, we should start to see those numbers normalize and um, I'll have a better understanding of how many cases we've got in York. Um, it's difficult to know what impact this has had over, over the weekend. So um, I can keep members um, up, updated on, on that. In terms of where we are then, this is the most recent um, data um, as of today. Um, York has had a total of 1,507 cases since March, which gives us a rate of 715.5 per 100,000 population. That sounds a lot, um, and our cases have been increasing recently but our rate in York is still lower than need national and, and regional averages. So even though we're seeing um, an upwards trend in cases, in a, in a, seeing a very similar trend to what's being seen nationally and regionally, um, our level is still below the national and, and regional averages. Um, over the when we then look at the um, positivity rate, so of, of the tests that, that have been done, um, how many of those are testing positive? Um, we have a rate of 7.55%. So that means that out of 2,750 five tests that were done, 208 of those were positive. So as you can see, there are a lot more tests being done um, than um, people who are testing positive at the moment. Our positivity rate in York is increasing in line with what we're seeing in many other parts of the country, um, particularly um, Leeds, um, West Yorkshire, the Northeast, for example. Um, our rate is now higher than the national, our positivity rate um, is higher, the national positivity rate is 6.3%, um, but lower than, than, than the regional average. And I was on a call with uh, DPH and some other colleagues um, in the Greater Manchester area on Friday, and they have a rate of, you know, um, of, of uh, over 150,000. So you can see, put York in a bit of perspective to where some other areas um, are. So um, at the moment, if you look at the last 14 days, we've had 34 cases um, linked to care homes. Um, because we're now 
testing staff in care homes as well as residents on a regular basis. Um, a number of those cases um, will be staff members. Um, so 34 cases linked to care homes, 30 cases linked to schools, um, and we are beginning to track the number of cases linked to universities as well. The reason I haven't got those figures to share with you at, at the moment is that um, on the um, national database that we have access to, it, it doesn't give us a great deal of detail as to which university or college these cases may be linked to. And also it talks about university age, so we can't extrapolate from that how many cases are, are linked to um, uh, Ask and Brian, York College, York St. John or University of York. We are, however, having good communication with those educational establishments and we'll start to get local intelligence, which will be more accurate. Um, about those numbers. So I should be able to share those numbers with you um, in future once I'm, I'm a bit more confident um, of the accuracy of, of, of those numbers. We're not seeing um, any excess deaths at the moment. There's been one death um, over the period 12th to 18th of September, which is the most recent data we have for deaths. Um, that was from um, confirmed or suspected COVID. Um, so even though we're seeing an increase in hospital admissions, we're not seeing an increase in deaths at the moment, which is very positive. We think that might be because the picture of um, uh, residents who are being infected with COVID has changed to how it was um, at the beginning of the pandemic in March. There we were looking at, um, at significantly more older people affected. Whereas what we can see with the demographic of the data we have now is that even though um, there are cases of COVID in all age groups, we know it's the um, younger age group, um, the kind of 15 to 30, which is the um, largest um, increase we've seen in cases. Fortunately, the people in that age group tend to be healthier. And so even though they may um, uh, contract COVID, um, because they're less likely to have underlying health conditions, um, it's, much more and it's much less likely to lead to a, a, a hospital admission. So that's the kind of picture we're seeing at the moment. We are beginning to see increased activity um, in, in the hospital. The hospital has stood up again, the regular reporting um, of, of cases. Um, there's always a bit of a time lag over the weekend with some of this data. Um, but um, as of um, Friday, we had um, 18 um, suspected or uh, confirmed COVID. Um, patients at York Hospital, that's York residents, and no one in um, critical care or ITU beds. So in summary then, just to analyse where we are with all of that, um, in common with most other parts of the country, we're seeing increased numbers of cases of COVID in York. That isn't hugely surprising. We were expecting that increase in cases. Um, what obviously it, it's it, it's a concern because we want to try and keep those numbers as as low as low as possible. Um, the public health team um, and other colleagues um, in education services in the council and public protection, for example, are working very hard with schools, with universities. We'll hear a little bit more about that work later on, but also with businesses as, as well, um, stepping up the enforcement work that we are doing with businesses um, where we come across any that, that aren't um, compliant with, with the regulations. Um, I had an update from um, environmental health colleagues this morning 
their view is that they're very pleased with how the majority of um, businesses and employers across York are pretty much compliant with the regulations which is you know to be welcomed and and I thank all of those businesses um, that are working very hard um, to keep York um, a safe place um, to, to, to work and visit. There have been a number of um, instances where environmental health have had to give verbal um, advice, they've followed that up with letters um, they're working very closely with the police um, around enforcement. Enforcement is seen as a last resort um, and at the moment the, all of the investment that's gone into building relationships with employers and businesses, um, doing those regular visits, um, giving the verbal warnings, the, the, the written letters seem to be working. And um, obviously enforcement is there as, as a tool that we can use if we have to. Um, but fortunately, we've not had to do that um, on a large scale yet, which is um, very, very welcome. I'll probably stop there, Chair, having given that kind of overview, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Sharon. That's, uh, that's really helpful. Um, just before I open to questions, just a, a quick um, point for the committee. Um, my apologies, I jumped across agenda item three, the public participation, because we didn't have any public participants, but I, I should have acknowledged that uh, before we dive straight into the uh, into the health update. Um, I will now um, invite um, questions. Um, I've got a number of people indicating. I'm just gonna uh, use my uh, chair's privilege just to ask for a quick clarification on the numbers, if I can, Sharon. Um, I appreciate there's been this national issue around um, uh, you know, data and, and, you know, I'm not sure whether it's correct to term it misreporting, but you know, the, the incorrect reporting of, of data. Um, but I think prior to that having um, been announced, um, you had, um, said something in a meeting around the um, rate per 100,000 in York was actually slightly higher than uh, a point at which government might intervene or might look to some, do some local lockdowns because of a, a delay in that reporting. And I just wondered if you can elaborate slightly on that, give us a bit of clarity over you know, where we are in terms of the likelihood of a, of a local lockdown and, okay. and perhaps what conversations might have been had yeah. around what that might look like. So um, there's always a bit of a time lag between the um, data that is published by Public Health England and what we know is, is going on. So we obviously have daily updated data. So last week I could see and, you know, the public health team could see that um, we had rapidly increasing numbers in cases and we were significantly higher than the Public Health England published um, uh, rate. Um, and so the government are in the process of changing the um, what they call the containment framework. Um, but under the old framework, um, we felt that York might have been put onto the government watch list. At, at that time, if cases got to over 50 per 100,000 population, um, local authorities could expect to be put onto this government watch list. And, and we felt that York was probably going to go on as an area of concern. Um, and that certainly some conversations that I was having with colleagues in Public Health England and in Department of Health and Social Care was that our numbers had increased sufficiently that we felt that we would have been identified as an area of concern. In the end, um, we narrowly missed going on to that watch list. So I was told that York was on the radar because we were almost at that point. Um, but there were other local authorities that are at a higher rate than York um, who were going on to the watch list. And so we, um, we, we, we weren't put on. 
What is now clear is that our validated seven day wait is into the 70s. Um, and our unvalidated date rate as a result of all of the extra cases that have been added over the weekend is now over 114. So if we were under the old system, we would definitely be on the watch list, I would argue, um, at least as an area of concern. Because we're in this transition period between the old containment framework and the new social distancing framework, which some of you who read The Guardian um, will have been aware that there was a story on that in The, on, in the Guardian over the weekend um, because it was leaked. Um, my understanding is that government will be signing off that new social distancing framework this week sometime. So we'll have a better understanding of what the criteria will be to go from level one to level two. Um, so that's kind of what was happening last week and what I was talking about in, 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 in the public domain. Um, I mean, on that, of course, the only way that we can really control um, the spread of cases is by people following the rules. Um, and, you know, those rules haven't changed. They're still um, maintaining social distancing. Two metres is always best. Um, wearing face coverings in those public places where um, social distancing is impossible. You know, regular hand washing, use of hand gel, you know, socially isolating if you have symptoms and requesting a test. Those basic steps have not changed. And those basic steps are still what we need everybody to be following in order to prevent the spread of, 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 of infection. Um, and so it's, you know, constantly reinforcing those, 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 those basic rules. But the data is a confusing picture at, at the moment. I absolutely accept that. Um, but hopefully over the next few days, it'll settle down and things will become a little bit clearer. Thank you, Sharon. Now, um, I don't think I've ever seen so many hands uh, raised at, at one time. So I'm, I'm going to just take you all in the order that you've, you've put your hands up. But um, given how many people are wanting to ask questions, if we can just do questions and answers relatively succinctly, that would be, be really helpful. So uh, Councillor Rowley's first. Lovely. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Sharon. And again, just uh, my thanks to you and your team and what you're doing um, at this difficult time. Sharon, we are aware that, that local authorities, that neighbourers have been put into lockdown um, and, and some still are and some, are, and some aren't. Um, and others, as you mentioned, are, are on the edge, as, as potentially are we. Um, what steps, if any, I'm, I'm aware, obviously, that you know, local lockdowns happen. Um, but what steps, if any, are being taken to control those who live in those areas that are currently locked down, who, who play their trade in York? And I'm thinking particularly of taxi drivers that come into the city um, and, and mingle with our student population. So what, what controls, if any, um, are being considered that are in place? It's really very difficult because unless the areas that they live in or are traveling from have lockdown restrictions that prevent them from traveling um, and um, that is enforced by you know, the police, um, it, it's almost impossible to st for us to stop people coming in from, from those areas. And, and I think that's, that's a particular challenge for us. Um, but yeah, there, there really isn't very much we can do, and unfortunately. Councillor Rowley, I think you want to follow up? Thank you, Chair. And it really is a, a supplementary and, and, and one I will get, get over quickly. Um, clearly, if, if, if somebody comes into the city, and I'm being very careful not to, to, to commercialise this, but if a taxi driver comes into our city with a, a, a taxi cab that has been licensed in an area that is clearly in lockdown, surely the local authority must have some, some recourse to be able to prevent them from playing their trade or alternatively um, you know, speak to the police to have some form of control because otherwise we, we, you know, we really are in a difficult situation. Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, thanks, uh, Councillor Rowley. I think Councillor Mason, uh, who is the chair of the licensing um, uh, in the city, stuck his hand up straight away. I wasn't sure if that was because you wanted to answer the point that uh, Councillor Rowley was making. I did, unless, I mean, obviously, if Sharon's got anything else to add, but I'll, I, I'm happy to give my, uh, the updates and bits of information that, that we've had. And we've, we've written to the Home Office on this and asked them for, you know, is there going to be any special powers for us to control areas like this? Uh, and there isn't, work, work is work, and they've issued uh, guidance about how that work should be carried out safely, like any other type of business. Uh, uh, tr trust me, the amount of conversations and things I've had with different people, with the Chief Constable, everything else, there's, there's, there's no legal power. Um, uh, unless one of these drivers should be self-isolating, there, there's absolutely nothing. And uh, I'm sure Sharon will, will back that up from what she's already said and what she might say now. But it, it's definitely an area we've really, really pushed on to see if there is any any movement, any you know, even any side powers or anything we could bring in. But uh, but no, I'm afraid, afraid there isn't from a licensing perspective in terms of our enforcement powers. The only thing we might be able to enforce is if we had um, evidence of um, taxi drivers failing to wear face coverings or failing to ensure that their passengers did. So if they, if, if we had evidence that they were breaching the regulations, then we might be able to act. But otherwise, no, I would agree with Councillor Mason. We've, we've looked into this um, uh, even before licensing looked at it, but there aren't any public health powers we can use, unfortunately. Thanks, Sharon. Um, now, just to uh, bring in, we've got um, Councillor Pearson, who's just joining the meeting late, and um, I'm told has uh, now joined the uh, the live feed. So, um, Councillor Pearson, if you want to switch your video on and show that you're with us at the virtual table, that'd be great. Great to have you here. Thank you. And uh, just going back then to the substantive, substantive questions, and actually it was Councillor Mason who had his hand up next, so I shall bring you straight back in with your question that you wish to ask. Brilliant. Thanks, Sharon. You were obviously saying then about the kind of ability to be able to pin pin groups of cases down potentially to an institution or an organisation. Obviously, hospitality is a big issue at the minute or a big a, a big topic of debate with this 10 o'clock curfew. Um, I was out with the licensing team on Saturday night and it's something that's coming up a lot. Do we have any data locally about how many cases are actually linked or being acquired within that sector? Um, we have partial data. So when people, um, if people are tested positive and they passed on to the National Test and Trace Service, if they um, provide details of their, who their employer is, then we can now see that information. So we can, and we've started to produce um, a spreadsheet that will allow us to be able to um, observe that data and analyze any trends that are emerging from particular um, businesses or, or workplaces. So we receive that data, but there's also a lot of local intelligence that we're receiving as well from um, members of the public or indeed whistleblowers um, who are employed by companies contacting um, either the inquiries public health mailbox or the public protection mailbox um, with information about um, concerns, you know, if people have visited a premises, they are employed by a premises that they're not following COVID rules. And then our environmental health um, colleagues are able to go out and, and, and inspect those businesses. So we use a combination of data and local intelligence. Um, at the moment, that seems to be working quite well. And we are beginning to get a fair picture of patterns of behavior across, which is allowing um, the public protection team to be able to target the work that, that, that they need to do. So um, it's important that that work is ongoing. Um, so that's something that you know will happen regularly. It's not going to be stop and start. We're going to have to keep doing that. So yeah, that is happening. Thanks, Sharon. Um, Councillor Mason, if you want to just ask a, a quick supplementary, um, you can, yeah. but um, we Thanks. just need to try and keep the meeting moving now, I think. Yeah, Thank no, you. I, I suppose my, my focus was more on, you know, is that is hospitality an area of more concern than anywhere else in terms of obviously the stringent restrictions in terms of curfews that have been put on them? Um, most of the transmission of cases we're seeing at the moment is still um, social contact. So 
people who have gone to a wedding, for example, and household transmission. We haven't identified any workplaces or hospitality sectors yet that have been linked to a major outbreak. We, we haven't seen that. Um, and I think that's largely because, as I said earlier, the vast majority of hospitality um, and shops, businesses, etc., are being pretty compliant um, with the COVID rules up to now. So, um, no, not, not identified any particular hotspots across the city, no. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, Councillor Kilbane. Um, I'll, I'll take that um, as an additional question to, to that, um, Chair, uh, instead, of, instead of my question. So, I mean, Sharon, I think, you know, as you said, and you said in your answer there, um, we've had no fines uh, in York. We've had no enforcement action at all uh, against hospitality. And the vast majority of the hospitality businesses are, um, are managing this, this process uh, really, really well. Um, I think this would be a good opportunity to praise um, those organisations who are doing so. Um, and also, I did notice uh, York found its um, five minutes of fame during, uh, during the week with the scenes that were filmed on Church Street. Um, as, as we know, the police um, cleared that scene uh, within half an hour. Everybody was gone by, I think, um, uh, 10.27. And I was just wondering, uh, and we haven't really seen, well, I've not been aware of any other scenes similar to that um since and I, I was just wondering if you think there's a little bit of um media hysteria going on in its reaction to that it's interesting isn't it because there were similar scenes in other cities um as well not 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 just york i think what we're seeing is something that um probably anybody could have predicted that if you're going to have all the pubs and restaurants close at the same time, you're going to see a spillage of people out onto the seats of the, street, the city at the same time. And obviously what we want to do is for those people to disperse quickly and, and not hang around in, in, in large groups. Um, this weekend, um, it's difficult to tell because the weather wasn't particularly good this weekend, um, but we did have community safety officers, we had bid rangers, um, we had our enforcement team, um, including um, some councillors um, out over the weekend, um, just observing what was going on in, in, in the city. And there were no repeats of um, the scenes that we saw last weekend. Um, and so hopefully um, with the, the measures that um, the enforcement teams are working on and the work that we're doing with those, um, with those traders, with looking at busking in the city, um, ways in which we can move groups of people on to, to try and prevent them all gathering in one place, we won't see a, a, a repeat of those scenes. Um, but obviously it's a concern. Um, we've identified it as an amber risk um, in our out, outbreak control plan um, risk register because obviously it does take additional resources from the police and our enforcement team to manage those behaviours. Um, but, you know, we just need to rely on people being sensible. The vast majority of people are sensible um, and continuing to work in partnership with colleagues across the city to kind of encourage those who are being perhaps a bit silly um, to behave more, more responsibly. But um, it certainly was better this weekend than the previous one. Thanks, Sharon. Um, I, I think that point that you made um, about it being predictable that if you chuck everybody out at the same time, you're going to create a you know a mass of people congregating. Um, you know, I think is is a very pertinent one. And I suppose my personal uh, anxiety with a lot of this, and and from some of what you're just saying there, is you know. I'd be very wary of, of seeking to enforce against buskers, for example, because, you know, they, they're people who have lost a significant income. There's a, there's a lot of people in the nighttime economy that are, are hurting perhaps more than some of the other parts of the economy. Um, and so, you know, we've got to try to, to find a balance between um, protecting 
those cultural institutions and then managing people's behaviors and, and I think you know the, the, the point you made very early on about you know really it comes down to following the social distancing rules and, and really reinforcing that at every opportunity because actually I've seen some really fantastic practice in the hospitality sector uh, in and around the city over the last few weeks of, of people doing very very safe um, sort of opening of, of pubs bars restaurants um, and and you know Councillor Kilbane's right to praise those people you know who, who have really taken a lot of effort and it would be a great shame if their businesses were um, made unviable by uh, through no fault of their own I suppose. Um, I'm just going to note that Councillor Mason's uh, internet connection appears to have failed and so he's currently left the meeting but we are trying to get him back in uh, and I will bring in Councillor Fenton with his question next. Thanks, Chair. Um, just a quick question for Sharon. You mentioned the um, <clears throat> positive test rate is 7.55%. Do you, I just wanted to be clear what, what that covers. Does that cover <clears throat> people who have symptoms and so have a test either delivered at home or they go to Poppleton? Um, plus the, 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 the regular testing that's being carried out, for example, of of care home staff and the care home residents. So is that 7.55% <clears throat> across all of those different different groups? Um, and if so, is there any further breakdown available in terms of um, sort of percentage of symptomatic people who request a test then turn yeah. out to be positive? Thank you. So um, that positivity rate is for everyone that is tested as part of pillar two. So it excludes um, people who were tested in hospital, for example, as uh, under pillar one, but it includes the regular testing of um, care home staff. Yes, and, and everybody who's tested under pillar two. Um, we, we tend not to get, uh, the only breakdown we'd be able to do of that would be a local analysis that, that we would do ourselves. Um, and I'm not sure whether we um, would have the resources within the business intelligence team to do a detailed breakdown on that. Um, what we tend to get at the moment is just the totality. So we know how many people are tested through Pillar 2. We know how many of those are tested positive. And, and then there's a calculation 100,000 population of what that positivity rate is. Um, so we probably could do a breakdown. I can certainly ask the um, business intelligence team how easy it, it would be to do that. Um, are you thinking that it might be of interest to know what the positivity rate might be in particular age groups or in particular settings? Is, is, is that what's behind your question councillor fenton i suppose it's it, <clears throat> sort of a, a, a sort of general request for as much granularity as possible in terms of <clears throat> i think if we have that kind of granularity of information it it might help inform you know strategy decisions etc but i suppose it's if it, if it were available it would be interesting to see but i don't really have a view as to what what it is i think it will tell us necessarily that uh, that we don't already know but if you could yeah. ask that that'd be, that'd be, yeah. that'd be great yeah thank you i can certainly at the moment we're we're drowning in data and um, from the start of the pandemic to not having any data we're now drowning in it and some of it is contradictory um but um i will raise that to the business intelligence team and ask the question to see what in future committees rather than me just giving you a verbal update perhaps you having a report or a presentation which actually gives you the, as much analysis as we can do of that data as possible to give you um, a more granular picture, as you say, of what's happening on in what's happening in York. I, I can certainly take that back and see what we can do for the next meeting. Thanks, Sharon. And perhaps um, something that committee members might wish to do is, is to have a think about any data or specific um, sort of KPI type um, 
uh, data that, that would be helpful for us to have um, and then we can always make that request to you uh, in, in terms of uh, bringing that to a future meeting. Um, I'm conscious of time and, and we're, we're slightly running over where I thought we might be on this particular section so I've just got Councillor Musson left with a blue hand up. I'm going to take that question and, and then move us on to the next agenda item. Uh, so Councillor Musson. Thanks Chair. Um, I actually was initially going to ask the question that you asked asked at the beginning um so this is kind of a follow-up to that which is that um to sharon sorry uh council Karasha asked you what the likelihood was that york would be added to the watch list and then you mentioned this leak in the guardian and the, the three level structure that's being discussed but i kind of wanted to restate the original question because as far as i understood the new framework is a draft and it's not confirmed and it seems I guess my question is, when will the government revisit its list of authorities on the watch list next? And given that the changed figures after this data has been added are higher than the, the previously known figures, which actually for the authorities that have been put on the watch list, I guess my question is, how can we not expect to be added? Because unless the goalposts are being moved, we now meet the same level that they were saying was high enough for other places. So yeah. I think... So I think yeah. Yeah. So all things being equal, you would think that I would receive a call tomorrow to say that York is going on the watch list. Why I'm caveating that is because we're in this transition from the system that has been in place to the new one. It's possible that um, there'll be a whole hold on that for this week. And um, while the government are reviewing the new social distancing framework and the new three levels. Um, but I will find out tomorrow. Um, Tuesday is the dreaded day where we either get the phone call to say we are on the watch list or, or we're not. So I would imagine that I would find out tomorrow. Thanks, Sharon. Um... Councillor Musson, was that an additional question or is it just a blue hand hasn't been put down? No, no, it's kind of, it's not really a question, but I guess is that answer saying that we can expect under the new structure to be put in one of those tiers of, of lockdown then? It's really difficult because, because I, I don't know exactly what criteria the government intend to use for whether you're in level one, two or three. And um, so I would expect that we might be in level one um, and that the areas that will go into level two are the ones that are currently in intervention. Um, but that's just a guess because until we receive more information on um, any changes that will be made to the leaked document and um, confirmation of the KPIs that are gonna be used to determine the threshold, as to whether local authorities in there in level one, two or three, it, it would just be a guess. So um, I, I need to kind of wait until we get more information and then I'll, I'll be, able, be able to update the, the, the committee on that. Thanks, Sharon. Um, Sorry, that's not a complete answer, but it's probably the best I can do. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Sharon, you're staying with us for the next agenda item, but I'm going to move us on now to uh, agenda item five, which is the updates on uh, the schools reopening. And so we're now joined by Amanda Hatton, who's the uh, corporate director for children, education and communities. Um, Amanda, did you want to just give us a, a quick sort of update and overview of the report that you've um, uh, put together for us? And then um, I'll invite members to ask questions. Will do. Afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I won't draw your attention to too many aspects of the report, other than to say what you've got is a report which outlines the full opening of schools and, and what's happened since then, which happened on the 7th of September. Um, remembering that... Oh, have I been cut out of the call? No, we've still got you. Am I still here? Yeah, okay. we've still got you. Um, remembering that Schools were, of course, open during the, the entirety of the, of the initial phase of the pandemic. We um, have a number of bits of the report that I, would, that I would draw your attention to. First bit's in para four, which is in relation to 
um, attendance. And you'll see that our attendance across all areas is higher than national average and that continues. Our attendance has continued to be very good. Um, last week, we were at 91.4 on our attendance of children with education, health and care plans, which was um, really significant. We also have had no issues in relation to schools transport, which again is very positive. We, it was an area that we were concerned about. Um, and that, that part of the system has been running really smoothly. We have unfortunately had some cases of COVID within some of our schools. And as you can see in the paper, it details three um, separate school incidents. But we have manage that with closing the minimum amount of bubbles that have been that have been necessary. Um, what I'd like to do is echo Sharon's point in relation to the strength of co-working between the schools community and public health. I have regular phone calls with YSAB and one of the things that's been really positive has been the YSAB has had very strong linkage with the public health team and has been using the public health inquiries inbox very frequently and found that incredibly helpful and, and also found the advice that they're getting from, from that mechanism very positive as well in so much as it's very measured, it's very nuanced in relation to the, the individual circumstances of the schools. And what that's meant is that we haven't ended up closing huge amounts of year groups or bubbles because we have had that granularity of detail that, that Sharon was talking about before. I think I'll stop there. Thanks, uh, thanks, Amanda. Um, so I'll, I'll invite questions from members. Um, just before I do, I, I think um, I would just like to note, partly with my governor hat on, and I'm sure that the other governors um, uh, at the table will, will um, confirm this, the, the, the effort and response that school staff have put in um, has just been phenomenal. And, and I really have to stress that in, in um, both as a, as a parent and as a governor from what I've seen. And, you know, nothing's ever perfect, but um, it, it's been quite something to see, I think, the, the amount of time and effort that's gone into trying to make the wider reopening of schools as, as safe as it possibly can be. Um, Councillor Hollier. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, and just to echo the points you just made then as well. Um, but I guess my question is, is just about um, what's the sort of academic support for, for pupils that are um, asked to isolate or, or they're, you know, as part of a, a bubble or individually? Um... Okay, um, it varies because um, for some children, the most appropriate way of supporting them is by virtual learning. Um, for others, it is by paper learning. So some younger children, actually, the, the kind of use of paper um, tools works better for them. There is um, a directive by the Secretary of State which has come in which says that schools have to provide um, virtual learning for all of those children who aren't able to access face-to-face -face learning and, and our schools have done that and done that consistently across the piece and are working together to share good practice and to share um, their ability to do that. At the moment they're not significantly impacted by any kind of health concerns in relation to their staff groups so there are enough staff to be able to support face-to-face -face education and also to be able to support those children who need that virtual that virtual learning. Were there to be in a situation where that wasn't the case, what the schools are doing is working together to think about how it can be that they can make sure that they can maintain what is now a statutory duty on them to provide that um, virtual support as well. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, Councillor Hunter. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Amanda. Um, my question is regarding um, track and trace. Is contact tracing within the schools supported by the national or the local track and trade system? And is there um, sufficient capacity to, uh, to provide the support? It's a little bit of both. They, um, schools are required to contact the national line, but are also um, contacting regional and local. What's certainly been the case is there's been a significant delay in getting through to the national line. So, you know, significant amounts of time that people are waiting on the phone. So I think what that's meant, and, and Sharon will, I'm no doubt, confirm this, is that our local arrangements have been much more heavily used and, and have been much more positively received because of that nuance in relation to the ability to provide very specific advice um, and quick advice as well. 
I think the other aspect of that has been that um, members of the public health team have been embedded in the YSAB calls that have happened right the way through the pandemic. So people know each other. And, and that's really important in this mm. in this kind of context that, you know, you're having a conversation with somebody that you know that you've previously spoken to that you feel comfortable with. And and that's really making a difference. Yeah. Okay. I think the, the other bit I'd say in that as well is that strength of relationship has really helped the schools to be COVID secure before the children went back. So we're, we're not seeing those examples of transmission within schools because the schools have set themselves up in such a way that, you know, where we have found cases, we've um, found members of staff, for example, who haven't had any contacts in the definition of contacts within the school because of the way the, the schools have been set up so that they've not actually been with, within two metres for more than 15 minutes or, you know, whatever the, the definition is. Sharon, did you want to just add something to that? Yes, it's just to echo what Amanda has said, really. Um, I mean, I made a decision with my team early on that we wanted to be proactive with schools and proactive with the prevention, as Amanda has said, in preparation for um, uh, more children coming back to school, but also because we were aware of all the difficulties with the national um, track and trace system. Um, for example, you know, we've got anecdotal reports from schools having been waiting days to have the information um, and sometimes it hasn't been accurate. Whereas, you know, while they're on hold waiting to, on, on a phone call to speak to somebody nationally, they can have contacted my team. They're already have had the advice and, and they're already doing what, what they need to do. So um, I think the local system has complicated, has complemented the national system. But certainly from what I hear, schools have found the local system so much better for the reasons that Amanda's um, already outlined. And I'm sure that's why, um, Amanda, we've had, we haven't had any schools close, um, which has happened in other areas because of the way that we've worked together. It's been so positive. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, Councillor Kilbane. All right, thank, thanks, Chair. Um, ju just regarding that and the, and, and the measures to make the, the, the schools COVID safe, uh, are there any particular measures in place to protect staff members uh, who are vulnerable, uh, would be covered by a shielding group, for example, and also the um, parents or guardians of any children who would also be in that group? In relation to um, staff members, they're very much taken on, on a, an individual case by case basis and looking at what the particular issues and particular concerns are for, for the staff member, um, whilst obviously following following national guidance. And, and similarly, um, the same with with families. And you know, following following the guidance that, that's there nationally, which is as Sharon said, the kind of really basic public health advice around making sure you're washing your hands, making sure you're wearing face coverings, making sure you're maintaining social distance wherever you possibly can. You'll note from the report that in terms of the secondary schools, Sharon and I both strongly advised the wearing of masks in public air, in communal areas where it's not possible to socially distance. And, and that's, that's gone down very well within the school community um, and has been very positively received. Two of our secondary schools have mandated that. We're not able to do that on their behalf, but they've done that because they, they talked to pupils and staff and, and it was felt that they all felt safer as a consequence of that. Um, and we are also looking at primary schools and communal space in primary schools. Thanks, uh, Sharon. Just, just, I'm just going to ask a, a quick supplementary on that, relating to the kind of protecting of, of the school staff. And, and it's not strictly COVID, so it, it may or may not fit either with Amanda or Sharon, but it occurred to me that you know, we give flu vaccines to um, key workers in, in a lot of different settings, but I'm not sure that we have a universal coverage of, of flu vaccines for um, school staff. And this year, more than ever, you know, we, we want to make sure that staff are not missing days through sickness for, for anything at all. And obviously COVID's the, the big kind of thing in, in our mind. But I, I just wondered what conversations have happened around 
um, you know, a citywide vaccination program for, for school staff uh, for flu. Do you want me to take that one, yeah, Amanda? It, it... Please. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so for those school staff who are eligible to have a free um, flu vaccine on the NHS, they would be invited by their GP practice um, to access a vaccination. For staff who fall outside um, the NHS criteria, it's the responsibility of the employer to organise um, a flu vaccine through their occupational health service. Um, it's, it's not the council's or public health's responsibility to do that. And so, for example, um, for um, the council as an employer for our staff, we have we work within but with our occupational health department and with HR. Um, we have a system in place for our staff um, uh, and flu vouchers to enable them to have um, take a voucher to a participating um, community pharmacy to be vaccinated. Um, so it's it's and so for schools that you know where they fall under the local authority. They would be able to access that system but for um, staff who are employed in academy trusts it's the occupational and the health hr departments that that need to organize the access to the flu vaccine and unless they're eligible on the nhs for a free one thanks thanks for that sharon um so i'm just going to move us quickly on i've got a couple more people indicating um but i'm going to start um trying to wrap this section up um councillor fenton That's better. Thank you, Chair. Um, it was just a question around Public Health England advice <clears throat> and guidance that's on off that's available to schools. Um, the message went out yesterday from one of the uh, primary schools in my ward saying that that I had a member of staff who tested positive <clears throat> and said, as we are not able to get public health guidance until tomorrow morning, i.e. today, we are requesting that year, year one and year two children remain at home which kind of triggered in my mind <clears throat> a, a question as to the extent to which public health guidance is available at weekends when you know, things will happen at weekends and schools will need to, 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 to respond and prepare. So is, is there anything that, I suppose, any observations I'd, I'd appreciate in terms of what support is, uh, is available to, to schools out of, out of hours, as it were? Sharon, do you want me to pick that one up? Because I've got feedback from schools in relation to that. Um, certainly our public health team is available out of hours and at weekends and is very well used out of hours and at weekends. Um, you know, if we're, we're Anita on this call or, or, you know, some of her other colleagues, she would she would detail how often she speaks to um, school staff out of hours at weekends when she's on leave you know um, I think because she's been very much part of those meetings she does have that relationship with them and and they do make significant amounts of contact with her and with the rest of the team through the inbox and and get advice at weekends so I'm I'm disappointed to hear that you had a, a, a head teacher who didn't feel that they were able to access that because they were definitely available over the weekend and 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 you know have been very well used. Sharon? Yeah, and, and in fact, I think that particular head teacher did speak to Anita in the end in my team because, um, as you say, the response they got from PHE was that there would be nobody uh, available to speak to them over the weekend. Um, PHE, the health protection team, is, is obviously very busy. Um, they have to cover the whole of Yorkshire and Humber. Um, as local public health teams, we work in partnership with the PHE health protection team. Um, they know that in York, we are um, very supportive of our schools. Um, and so it, 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 it might be that whoever they spoke to was aware that they would have been able to contact um, the local public health team. We have an on-call rota that, that, that we manage at weekends and on bank holidays as well. Um, but I think this is a feature of the national system. We know that it's not perfect and it has shortcomings. 
And so local authority public health teams, wherever possible, um, are, are, are needing to step up and provide that local support. But I must say we're doing it without additional resources. So um, it's, it's, it's really difficult and, you know, some of my staff are getting very tired. Um, and so, you know, that lobbying, which I know the administration in York is doing, as, as are other administrations, you know, lobbying for additional resources for local authority teams who are working very hard to try and keep you know, keep on the show, the show on the road and their local authorities, you know, to keep businesses open, to keep schools open, um, you know, to support employers. And um, we're working very hard um, uh, and it is challenging with the resources that, that, that we've got. But yes, um, we are available. We'll be available Christmas Day. We'll be available Boxing Day, New Year's Day. We, we have a rotor to ensure that anyone who needs local support are, are, are able to get it. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, I'm just very quickly going to go to, um, I've got Councillor Rowley and Councillor Mason um, both waiting. Um, I'll, I'll take both your questions, but um, if we can just be, be quick in, in question and answer, and then we'll get this section wrapped up now. Uh, Councillor Rowley. Thank you, Chair, and, and I will be quick. Um, this is an issue that I have raised with the uh, with the head teacher of uh, the, the the senior school that's, that's just on the border of my ward. It's actually Councillor Musson's ward, and that's Archbishop Hargate School. Their answer was they can only control the controllables, uh, which are within their within their grasp. And I'm referring to the numbers of pupils that are leaving school en masse at the end of the day. Now, all schools, all senior schools, do have a timed slot for exit. And they control and monitor that very, very well. Um, but I have been quite alarmed uh, by the numbers of, of uh, pupils that are congregating after school, and particularly around some of the retail areas, um, which I, when I left school as a kid, I used to do that. You go to the shop, you spend whatever dinner money you didn't spend at school. Um, what, what, it, what, what, what options do the council, the local authority have, um, maybe in association with the, with the police, to try and just move these groups on? Because they do congregate around the retail areas. And it is concerning, particularly for elderly and vulnerable residents. Should I pick that up in part? Um, th that has been raised as an issue. And, and I meet with York Schools and Academies Board every Friday. So I raised it with them on Friday. They are very clear with parents and with their pupils about the, the need to socially distance both when they're at school and traveling to and from school and are reinforcing that and do reinforce that out with that the response you got from the head teacher is is accurate you know all they can do is is request young people to do that if young people are causing a kind of public nuisance then there are enforcement activities but young people just going home but being perceived as in as in larger groups, I'm not clear there is anything that we can do from um, from a kind of public order perspective because they're not actually doing anything than, other than just going home. Um, but I do know that some residents have been worried by that. What the schools do do is they publish on their websites the times that their school day ends so that people can avoid that time of day if they want to do so that you know when streets are likely to be a little bit more busy they can they can avoid that and they have staggered where possible but there is a limit to how much you can stagger those school days. Councillor Rowley quickly. Sorry, Chair, I don't want to drag this on because I'm aware that you wanted to move on. I, I, Sh Amanda and Sean, I appreciate what you're saying and Amanda I obviously have lots of conversations with my head teacher and with the chair of, of governors. Um, the, the, it's, it's not to do with the numbers of young people that are leaving because kids leave school and they, and, and they do generally move relatively quickly. A lot of the kids do stop in retail areas and congregate in retail areas in large numbers. So that's the bit that I think we should try and address. Not the when you leave, go home. If every child left and went home, there wouldn't be an issue. It's the congregating in large numbers around retail areas. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Rowley. I, I, I think um, rather than asking officers to, to respond directly on that point, we'll, we'll, we'll note it. And then um, if that's something that we want to um, 
pick up uh, with a written answer or, or you know any follow up, um, we can do so. Um, Councillor Mason, I'll, I'll uh, just very quickly bring you in as well. S super quick, and it, and it's just a point. I didn't want to make really any questions on this because I've had such an operational insight into what's going on, but I, I just think we should be so proud, particularly the public health team, the 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 turnaround time for getting answers to questions. Uh, you know, like you said, that nuanced approach, understanding schools, having conversations. I, I just can't say uh, how impressed I've been, you know, and, and obviously being a councillor, I'm biased. But without that, you know, I chat to colleagues that are based in other parts of North Yorkshire, based up uh, Newcastle, West Yorkshire, and the service they're getting is appalling. So we should be so, so, so proud of what we've done. Honestly, it's, uh, it's, it's made my job a hell of a lot easier. And I imagine it's made teachers and head teachers, you know. Uh, uh, reduce huge headaches I think you know especially you know people like Anita just just the responses and the and like I said that approach is just uh, you know I can't I can't commend it highly enough honestly it's been been such a such a relief and support Thanks, uh, Councillor Mason. So um, I'm just going to, I did have a couple of questions, but I, I think uh, I, shall, I shall park those questions. I, I will just make a, a quick point of just being sort of surprised in a way to note on, on page 10, um, paragraph seven, where the ongoing challenges highlighted by primary head teachers didn't include pupil stamina because I think speaking as a parent that's that's a real issue actually is kids who've been out of school for six months getting used to back used to the idea of, of um, being in a long school day and being around um, you know friends that they perhaps haven't seen um, certainly if our Friday evenings are anything to go by they're, they're exhausted by the time they get to the end of the week um, so I think you know related to that is also wanting to just ensure that schools aren't put under undue pressure to make the catch up for the time missed um, too rapid because I think you know the kids need to get back used to being in school but also I wouldn't want to see them losing out on playtime and, and some of those things that, that children need to, to help them manage the school day um, so as I say they, they were perhaps areas I, I might have asked about but they, I'll just I'll chuck them in there as, as my thoughts and observations really um, so that will just leave me to uh, thank you Amanda for, for joining us uh, and um, uh, that's been a really helpful update. Um, you're now free to leave the meeting and, and we will uh, see you again soon, I'm sure. Um, everybody else, um, what I'm going to do is just take a quick five minute adjournment now uh, and I'd like us to be back in the room ready to start bang on the dot of quarter past three. So uh, if you can just be switching off your video feeds now and then uh, we'll uh, call that five minute adjournment.
Right, welcome back everyone to this afternoon's meeting of Customer Corporate Services and Scrutiny Management Committee. Um, we are moving on now to agenda item six, which is the update on the return of universities. Um, we still have Sharon Stoltz, the Director of Public Health on the call, um, but we're now joined by Nick Sinclair, who's a Public Health Specialist, and also Charlie Jeffrey, who is the Vice Chancellor of the University of York. Um, so I think I'll first invite uh, Nick Sinclair just to give us uh, a sort of overview of the report that he's put together uh, and any updates before moving on to uh, ask Charlie Jeffrey to do something similar. Thank you Chair, um, thanks for inviting me along today. Um, uh, sorry, can I just, just to interrupt, our democracy officer is struggling to rejoin so if we just hold on to till they return. Thank you. Okay, in which case we will just hang fire for, for two minutes and uh, we can all sit here looking pretty and uh, uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to tell you some kind of an exciting anecdote just to keep everybody entertained, but uh, I'm sure it'll end up embarrassing my children or something like that. So uh, probably, probably best not. All right, you are ready to resume. In which case I will hand straight over to Nick and uh, back as you were. Thank you, Chair. Um, so yeah, hopefully you've all had the opportunity to read the report. Um, I won't go into it in, in lo loads of detail, so I'll just pick out some of the key points really. Um, I, I think the approach with university uh, universities sort of very much echoes the approach taken with with schools in that we've we've tried to take a very sort of proactive supportive approach to uh, the institutions and supporting the institutions in their preparedness uh, and, and getting back to welcoming students into the city so um, as part of the outbreak control plan uh, universities as a, as a setting were identified as one of our kind of high risk locations um because because of the number of uh, of people that that, that, are, that are there and attend them um uh, and the amount of focus that, that we we felt would be required to to support those institutions to be sort of as covid secure as possible so we've we've got through that process um uh, an identified lead within within the public health team who's who's kind of supporting uh, the institutions uh, to, to work on their preparedness plans. Um, we've uh, set up a, a subgroup, uh, a universities and colleges subgroup of the outbreak management board, uh, and and alongside that, there's a, a universities and colleges preparedness group that uh, looks more at the, the sort of the operational issues around um, get, getting the institutions back uh, to 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 you know. Uh, support and uh, teach students. Um, so we've we've done a lot of work, really, uh, and you know the individual institutions have, have put an, an immense amount of effort into planning and, and preparing for for return of students, uh, and that's been going on for a number of months, really. And we're, we're just at the point now where we're seeing students returning to the city and have been returning for for the last couple of weeks. Um, and each institution has completed its own risk assessments um, and, and that's had some sort of support and input from the public health team uh, to make sure that, that you know they're covering all of the the points that would uh, be required within the guidance and that includes uh, a whole range of work completed around the states and facilities uh, looking at you know things like the face covering policies within each institution and how they've been developed and and actually, the institutions have taken, the, you know, a very sort of proactive and 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 kind of uh, sensible and 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 shared approach between themselves to to require face coverings to be worn, you know, where social distancing can't be maintained. Um, and facility management arrangements have been put in place to make sure that the physical spaces are are, are as suitable as possible to be used. But but I think again. Uh, those have been very limited in, in terms of usage compared to sort of last academic year, um, where a lot of the um, sort of learning uh, environments are, are being moved to, to online facilities. Um, and, and supporting all of that, there's there's been uh, a, a few sort of desktop emergency planning exercises which allowed the institutions to work through scenarios uh, and, and plan and prepare for how they might deal with those if you know if and when they arise um, 
and and so that's been supported as well by some regional uh, webinars by the Yorkshire and Humber Health Protection Team, uh, as well as the local public health team. Um, and then in terms of staffing, the institutions were uh, and, 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 and have uh, looked at sort of phase staffing return as, you know, courses were prepared and as uh, facilities were, were, were prepared uh, and as, you know, students returned to the, to the university, um, risk assessments have been completed, provision of, of sort of adequate teaching environments with uh, suitable protective equipment uh, and, and sort of good information sharing processes between staff and, and students and, and, and the institutions uh, have, have been set up. Um, the communication, I think, has been really key uh, and, and a significantly important part of, of the process. Uh, we've got some good uh, working arrangements with the institutions where we're getting some local sort of soft intelligence of, you know, the number of people that, uh, that are self-isolating. The, the you know the, the the regular communication and access to, to public health advice from the local team is is there, where um, the people are you know self-isolating or have received a positive case and and the institutions are doing their, their sort of uh, an assessment of risk about who else might have come into contact with those with those people who've tested positive um and the, the there's been a, a really significant focus on ensuring that messages to, to students are um there throughout their the whole sort of onboarding and, and joining uh, process and moving into halls or returning to 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 courses, um, so that you know the the students can contact and, and inform the universities if they if they're needing to self isolate, so that the pastoral and welfare needs can be considered. Um, and then I think in terms of traditional Freshers Week events, um, a lot of effort's been put into moving those towards. Um, virtual uh virtually supported uh, events uh, and and kind of ensuring that the students are, are are only going out in household groups uh, and not mixing outside of the the rule of six so so a lot of effort's been put into the um the messaging and the support for 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 students to to do um to to comply with the guidance um bus services have have been sort of adapted and and messages for, for students are, are are around you know trying to ensure that bus services are uh, only used when absolutely necessary because you know people who who are you know reliant on those bus services uh are are, are kind of given priority where where possible uh and and specific university uh, bus service has been put on put in place by first bus uh, to 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 try and reduce the pressure on on students using uh, other bus services that that you know other members of the the community might benefit from more, um, and then a range of uh, work's been done to to support sort of um, student accommodation. Um, so we've worked with both private um, student accommodation providers to support them to. Uh, look at and review their risk assessments, um, as well as, you know, looking at how uh, halls of residence um, can be supported to, to become sort of safe living environments for those household members within them uh, and defining those household members as, as, as a group so that uh, people are very clear sort of who, who, they, who they can socialise with and who they can't socialise with. Um, and all of this has really been underpinned by what we call in standard operating procedure, which outlines processes that we've put in place to help us share that information about uh, people who are self-isolating, both, both students and staff, uh, people who are testing positive, again, both students and staff, uh, and the process for sort of informing the local uh, public health team, as well as the regional health protection team around that, which, which facilitates the, 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 the contact tracing uh, work that, that's being done. Um, what, what, I'm just, what I'm just going to ask you to do, if if, uh, if I can, is um, if you can just take us, just highlight to us uh, any of the sort of rest of the report that is um, 
you know, you think is, is worthy for us to know. I think we, we'll just take it as read that um, committee members have, have read the whole report through. Um, and if there's anything you particularly wanted to, to flag to us, I'm just conscious of time and, and I'm sure that there'll be a lot of questions um, that, that people will want to put to both yourself and, and uh, Charlie. Yeah, no, fine. So, Sorry, yeah. apologies. I said I'd be brief, and I and I was I was waffling a bit. So thanks for uh, stepping in. Um, I think I think probably the, uh, the 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 key thing to point out is is the work that we've done to improve access to testing. So we've we've got um, uh, we had some concerns uh, around sort of students perhaps not being able to access testing facility at Poppleton because a lot of students don't have access to a car and couldn't drive. Um, there were questions in our minds about how accessible a home test kit might be for students who who, who didn't have um, you know a history at an accommodation and may not you know be verified to living at that address. So so we put in place a system where those students who are in halls of residence and couldn't access a test in other ways can access a local uh, resource of testing swabs that are delivered to each institution and then those institutions deliver them on to to, to students so that we can ensure that, that testing is available to all of those students and then probably the other key thing is 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 again a lot of emphasis and focus has been put on the basic messages of of you know maintaining social distancing wearing a face covering good hand hygiene and self-isolating when when you do have symptoms um and 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 that's been a real focus of, of the messages so I, I'll, I'll probably leave it there because those are probably the, the, the two other key things i wanted to say Thanks, Nick. That's really helpful. Um, and then if I can just go to, to Charlie and um, perhaps if you can just give us a, a bit of an overview um, of, of you know, where things are from your perspective. And, and thanks again for, for providing the, uh, the report that you have done. Thanks very much, Councillor. Good to be with you. Um, a, a little bit of context. Um, the UK government has been clear that education, uh, including universities, is a priority and that students should attend. Uh, this is the overwhelming view of students as well who, who really want to get back to uh, their studies and the next phase in their lives. Um, it's also clear, and this was made uh, very clear in SAGE, a, a, a guidance to government, uh, that there will be COVID outbreaks in universities simply because of the scale uh, of university communities uh, and the higher prevalence uh, epidemiologically of the virus among younger people. Uh, we've been planning for months to mitigate those risks. Nick has talked through quite a bit of that, so I won't repeat it. Um, the biggest change has been to move the majority of our teaching online uh, and for on-campus teaching to be carried out only in small groups under the uh, safety conditions that Nick has outlined. We've also been very keen to um, make behavioral interventions, establishing codes of, of conduct uh, establishing um, a, a clear understanding that mutual responsibility is, is important. Everyone else's risk is minimised uh, the more that I uh, minimise the risks that I engage in. And that's the message we've been trying to get uh, across. We've also put in place a number of uh, social and recreational facilities outside, undercover, uh, very carefully managed uh, and monitored. They're probably the safest place uh, to go for uh, a drink, spend a couple of hours with friends uh, in, uh, in New York. Uh, I've just walked around the university in the last hour. Uh, it's all calm, it's quite quiet. Um, students are generally uh, walking around with face masks on even outside. I think they are, they've absorbed those uh, messages. All that is to minimize, but it can't prevent COVID cases. And you'll have seen reports in the last days of, uh, of cases at our universities. Um, the, the latest count I had from the University of York this morning was 54, 54 active positive uh, cases, uh, all associated with household uh, transmission, uh, not uh, transmission in, uh, in teaching uh, related uh, settings. Uh, York's and John's figures on Friday were less than 25 in the way that they express it. It will have gone up uh, over the weekend. Uh, the, the citywide collaboration has been excellent. Uh, the two universities and the two colleges working together with uh, City Council Public Health Team and NHS. Uh, Nick touched on lots of that. I'd, I'd pick out two, two things around testing and tracing. 
uh, collectively, we've managed to, to produce some workarounds, the, the limitation of the, the national system. Uh, and then we had the big breakthrough in collectively lobbying for the walk-in centre, which is now up and running. Uh, I wandered up there earlier, and again, it's got a flow of people going through it. It's, it's live and supporting our community. Uh, the other part is tracing. Um, I think the speed of testing seems fine, uh, and the speed of getting results back seems fine. Uh, national tracing is not kicking in as quickly as we would like, so I'm delighted that the city has, uh, has managed to get all the permissions it needs uh, to kick in to support tracing. Uh, and we are stepping in as soon as we hear of cases to make sure we get immediate household isolations in place uh, and any, uh, any alert to um, a possible classroom uh, exposure uh, as well. Uh, lots of um, reporting about students in self-isolation in other cities. Um, my, my approach is that self-isolation is a selfless act. It's a community spirited act. It's not a punishment. Uh, and we need to do everything we can to support those uh, in self-isolation with essential provisions, essential uh, services, uh, with measures to prevent um, uh, mental uh, isolation. Um, so we've got our students' unions working uh, very actively to provide online uh, recreational activities. We have online resources for mental health and wellbeing support. Uh, and we're putting daily personal contact in place for anyone who is self uh, isolating, just to keep uh, keep in touch and, and understand if there are any issues that we haven't anticipated or if the student needs extra support. All of this is, of course, always under review and we're learning lessons as we, we go along. Um, we, we have a, a, a tiering system under Department for Education guidance, which has four tiers, which we will move through uh, if we need to do so. We're currently in tier one, which is broadly uh, with blended learning and other uh, research and, and student activity on campus. Tier four is lockdown, where pretty much everything except for essential research and uh, some uh, training elements for, for healthcare students would, would cease in a face-to-face -face way. Tiers two and three are, are intermediate. Any decisions on moving between those will either happen as a result of changing national uh, guidance, which is quite possible, uh, or uh, conversations locally about uh, the, the, the local epidemiological situation. And, uh, and, and I'm grateful that we have that strong collaboration uh, within which to have those conversations. Last word on Christmas. Um, one of our uh, cabinet ministers last week uh, made a rather unfortunate suggestion that Christmas might be cancelled uh, for students uh, on the basis that they would travel around the country and, uh, and potentially um, uh, spread virus back into, uh, into their home communities and their families. Uh, I, I felt that was an example of, uh, of students being expected to hold to higher standards than everyone else because there will be millions of people, not just students, traveling around the country uh, at Christmas for, for various family and, and other reasons. Uh, we're in, a, in an intense conversation with the Department for Education over this, working with them to produce some guidance, which I think will end up being uh, rather more practical uh, than, than some of the uh, some of the indications we, we may have heard last week. Uh, Councillor, I'll, I'll stop there. I hope I haven't gone on for too long. No, thank you. That's, uh, that's really helpful. And I will uh, invite members now, if anybody has any questions, if you could uh, stick your blue hand up and I shall, I shall bring you in uh, as uh, in the order that I see you. So, uh, Councillor Kilbane. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you both for, for the reports. Um, re re really good to see, really um, really good to hear that uh, most of our students are um, behaving very responsibly. Um, can I just ask you, Charlie, how, how, how are you ensuring that your sort of high-level policies um, are actually implemented on the, on the ground? Because um, obviously we hear all kinds of things, but, you know, if you've got your buildings restricted to, say, 25% capacity, um, how can you make sure that departments don't try and bend the rules to get in more than the 25%? Uh, we, we have um, a guideline for staff presence of 25%. Um, it can be higher if there is an appropriate risk assessment uh, that is done. 
Um, I, I don't think any any departments have an interest in bending the rules. I think they have an interest in uh, in in keeping everyone as safe as they possibly uh, can. Um, I, I've certainly just wandered around uh, and uh, I popped into probably ten departments, uh, and and I can say things were very quiet. Um, and the receptionists, uh, the ones I typically spoke with, were were saying that there were very few uh, members of staff actually in. Uh, we, we have a number of, uh, of attitudes among our staff. Uh, some are, are very concerned about being on campus. Some are absolutely desperate to, to have access to their, their offices and research facilities. And, and I think that's balancing out uh, in the round in a way which, which generally caters to the, uh, to the views of the staff concerned. Councillor Kilbane, I think you had an additional question. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. I, I was thinking along the lines of, um, do you have whistleblowing procedures in place for this, and is it encouraged? Um, we, we have a, a general uh, whistleblowing procedure, as, as organisations of, of all kinds do these days. Uh, and, and I am very concerned that if there are issues which arise in any part of the university, uh, and people have concerns about them, that they uh, report them. Uh, my approach is to be very transparent uh, to, to staff and to students about the challenges that face us. Uh, and I would encourage anyone who has a concern they don't think is, is, is being addressed in the right way to raise it. Councillor Hunter. Thanks, Chair. Um, mine's regarding um, St John's um, University students. Have there been any concerns or issues regarding um, the students accessing tests? And cost transport could be an issue for the, um, the students. Is there any extra support provided for them to travel across the city to the University of York for the um, walking testing site there? I think the, the general sense is we don't want people travelling um, to a walk-in site. Um, if, if there is uh, the possibility of travelling, I think people should be directed through the system to, to the Poppleton uh, site. Um, we had to, to, to site the, uh, the, the walk-in centre somewhere, uh, and it was always going to be a, a compromise. Um, between some of the needs around universities and some of the needs around our, our local communities. Uh, a, a number of different sites were, were explored. Sharon can probably say a little bit more about the, uh, the process which led to, to that one. It isn't actually a, a very long way from, from York St John. Uh, it's probably about 30, 35 minutes uh, walk, uh, which uh, is, is not as good as five minutes walk, but, but better than, uh, better than Poppleton. Uh, and I'm also aware that uh, York St John, and, and obviously with support of, of the rest of, of our group, uh, is exploring whether there can be an additional um, smaller facility uh, made available closer to it or on its own campus. Uh, I don't think we, we have stopped uh, our efforts in getting additional testing capability uh, in, in the city. We, we really want to, to press on and get more if we can. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sharon, did you want to uh, just add something to that? Yes, just um, as Nick alluded to when he presented his report earlier, we work very closely with all of the um, higher education institutions, just as we do with schools, um, and have already put in place a system by which we can get swabs out to students that need it. Um, we have a system whereby um, York St. John can contact um, Nick or one of the other colleagues in the public health team. We have a panel that meets at 2.30 every day to look at the swab requests and, and, and we can mobilise um, a swab quite quickly um, to get to a student if, if they needed it. So Charlie is absolutely right of the structural work that we're still doing to improve access to testing for the whole of the city, not just for students, but for residents as well. That work is ongoing, but we do have those interim measures in place, as Nick has described, so that no student who, who needs a swab um, is, is refused access to one. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, thanks for your report. Um, my question is about um, 
obviously the university has uh, some research facilities and lab resources perhaps uh, and I'm just wondering if um, any progress has been made in using that resource to, to ha perhaps increase testing capacity in the in the city and in the region and I think, I think it's been mentioned before by Charlie so I wondered if Charlie might answer that. <laughs> Um, thank, thank you very much for that question. I'd be absolutely delighted if we could do that. Um, uh, and, and it's an issue that we're actively exploring uh, on a regional basis. So with, uh, with Sharon and her counterpart in Hull, uh, with the hospital test leads uh, in, in each city and, and between the two universities. Um, th there are some, some challenges, um, both uh, logistical and um, uh, around approvals for that course of action. Uh, I take heart from the way in which our testing machinery and some of our staff uh, were relocated to the hospital back in uh, at the end of March and, uh, and in April uh, to support local testing capability at that moment of need. Uh, I'm hopeful that we can recreate uh, that kind of collaboration uh, again in a way which will boost local uh, capabilities and, and uh, as I said, across the region with Hull as well. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, Councillor Fenton. Thank you, Chair. Um, just picking up on uh, Charlie's point about support for students who are uh, self-isolating, it's good to know that <clears throat> that they're being um, looked after as they uh, <clears throat> they serve their time, as it were. It, it just prompted a, a thought in my mind about international students who. <clears throat> who may come over and then have to um, have to quarantine. And I'm guessing if I arrived in an unfamiliar country in an unfamiliar town and, and was told to stay in a, <laughs> in a room for two weeks, it might uh, might not be the best or happiest start to my academic career. So I just wondered what um, support was being put in place for for those students who find themselves in that in that situation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that is indeed the case for almost all uh, international students, uh, unless they're not on the, the UK government uh, um, travel uh, watch list. Uh, most of the students that, that we recruit will be on that list. Uh, they will certainly know about that before they come. It won't be a surprise uh, on their arrival where, where possible. Uh, we are meeting them at the, the point uh, of entry and transporting them uh, to their, uh, their accommodation here. Uh, and, and they will have uh, two weeks of free accommodation uh, through that quarantine period, uh, during which they will be provided with um, all, all the daily essentials they might want. Uh, obviously, it's, it's not, not what we would want as, as a welcome to, uh, to students from elsewhere, but it's what we have to do to, to comply with the rules. Um, I should also say that um, uh, I, I don't have the current number to hand and some, some have probably ended their quarantine period already. Uh, but we now have um, the, the start of, of some charter flights that we have organised together with a number of other universities in Northern England, uh, which are flying students in from China on a daily uh, basis. Um, and, and they are being uh, picked up direct from the airport in Manchester, transported directly here. Uh, and that will be an arrangement continuing for the next two months. There'll be a, a small trickle of students uh, through that uh, route and through that quarantine process for some time to come. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kilbane. Oh, th thanks again, Chair. Uh, Chair. Um, it's a, it's a, qu a question to uh, Nick, uh, mainly to give Charlie a rest. Is, um, Nick, in, in the work that you've done so far uh, on, on this subject, how much involvement have you had from the um, FE and HE uh, staff unions? Um, so I, I think the, individually the institutions have done a lot of work directly with, with the unions that, that represent their members that, that are in those institutions. I've, I personally have attended a, a couple of uh, union meetings um, to to sort of update on on what we're doing, um, but but that has been a consideration throughout. Um, the, the you know the risk assessments have been developed and consulted on with the unions uh, at various stages. Um, so I think that that you know individually there's been good engagement with the unions. 
Could I offer a, a supplement there, Councillor Crawshaw? Of course, yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm meeting with our campus unions, uh, three UCU, Unite and Unison, on a weekly basis, an hour a week. My HR director or one of her senior colleagues is, is meeting them on two other occasions. Uh, and then my director of health and safety is meeting them on a weekly uh, basis. Uh, the Health, Safety and Welfare Committee is our framework for risk assessment, which uh, by statute in, involves our unions. Uh, they, they've been involved on at every step of, of the way and, and there's an equivalent process uh, at York St John and, and the other institutions. Um, I, I think this is, this is the moment at which our unions have been most engaged with the business of the university, probably in its history. Um, and, and one reflection of that is that we have, uh, uh, in, in reflection of that commitment, funded additional facilities time to, to ensure that um, elected union representatives can fulfil uh, those opportunities. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, Councillor Kilbane, was that a, a supplementary question or a, a new line of questioning that you wanted to? Um, I have both, but we better go with the supplementary first. Yep. Yeah, well, it, it, supplementary away, and then and then I'll bring you in for your for your other question as well, because there's nobody else waiting. So. Just 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 thanks for that, Charlie. My, my, my question really was directed uh, at the public health team, just because I saw no mention of the staff unions in the report, um, which rang some alarm bells um, for me. Um, just in terms of the the moving of of the teaching uh, online. As, as somebody who has moved face-to-face uh, -face teaching onto an online course in the past, it takes an enormous amount of um, time um, to do. So uh, have we got more tutors and lecturers involved, employed at the university to do that now? Or are some things having to be dropped just because obviously you've only got so many hours in the day? You're quite right that we, we only have so many hours in the day, but we, but we have been planning for this moment um, effectively since the point of lockdown. It, it was pretty clear at that point that we would um, be looking at some extensive level of, of online teaching. Uh, so we put a group of, uh, of colleagues together with, uh, with online expertise um, to advise uh, our, our departments. And we've had um, something we call the Academic Contingencies uh, Group which has been working probably on uh, two or three meetings a week uh, to produce very extensive guidance uh, for colleagues across uh, the university. Now, this is um, um, work additional to that, which, which colleagues would have been uh, developing um, in, in order to, to prepare their teaching. Uh, we don't have the facility to employ additional uh, staff. Um, you, you may understand that universities have already faced significant financial pressures because of, uh, of COVID. Uh, and the, the financial position in the coming year uh, remains quite uncertain uh, until we know exactly how many international students uh, appear uh, and, and other contingencies that, that may well befall us. So we, we are managing uh, carefully within uh, our existing staffing resources. We're enabling uh, our departments to employ uh, postgraduate tutors to give uh, some uh, support uh, and inevitably there are there are compromises over over other areas of act activity uh, which which cannot get the same attention if we have to focus so hard at this exceptional moment on our students thanks for that charlie i'm, I'm just going to ask a supplementary to that actually um because it was something that i was interested in from your report about um you know the, the changes to teaching and learning and there's obviously a tension isn't there between students who are paying now a fee to attend university and are kind of encouraged to expect then a certain level of um you know whether it's face-to-face -face teaching or, or you know support versus the additional costs that the universities are having to bear to try to deliver the same amount of teaching and, and resource that was previously uh, delivered face-to-face -face. and what thought has been given to you know how you're communicating that both to the student body but also to the wider public I suppose in, in terms of you know the, the pressure that the university is facing because I think you know the students it, you know they rightfully want to get the best education they possibly can and, and this the university rightfully wants to deliver that but there's an inherent tension I think at the moment. 
Well, well, I think I think that most um, students recognise that we're in an exceptional um, situation, and that um, in that situation we we cannot deliver uh, in a in an in person uh, way uh, what we normally would. That doesn't mean that the people delivering online uh, are any less uh, brilliant in their fields and, and any less capable of conveying uh, the insight from their expertise uh, to students. And, and to an extent, we've probably surprised ourselves uh, with the facility with which we have uh, delivered uh, effective online teaching since March, um, uh, when, when we had to move very quickly uh, into that mode. But I'd also say um, that you know, university fees are not calculated on the basis of the hours of face-to-face -face teaching. They're calculated on the basis of, uh, of the wider facilities that universities uh, provide, the library, careers facilities, skills development facilities, the campus uh, it, itself, uh, and, and any, any conversations which reduce fees to hours of teaching, I think are extremely uh, misleading. Uh, and that's the kind of message that we have been uh, trying to convey to to students and and in the background to parents, but also uh, to to government. We have seen one or two unhelpful interventions by by MPs who who might know a little better, uh, and and we have had to work hard to to counter that. Thanks for that, uh, Councillor Rowley. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, again, uh, thank you, Charlie, for your report and, and Nick for yours. Um, this is a question for Charlie, really. Um, and and it's, I don't think it's been addressed in your report, and, and it's just for information, really. Um, you've mentioned about the online offer, um, and uh, a student that I know who went to a, a local university, not here in York, and I think they have something like just 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 literally four hours of uh, of, of online lectures uh, a week, and that's it. That's that's all they have for, for their degree. There's a lot of other work that they need to do. But my question to you, Charlie, is, is this, and it, I'm just a simple yes or no, really. Is there an offer? So so a student would be reluctant to physically come to the university, but still want to gain a degree through the University of York. Is there an offer for that student to do that purely remotely, or do they have to come to York to register and, and, and everything else? That's not a yes or no answer, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> uh, we are having to provide uh, an, an off-campus uh, um, facility at the moment because, as, as I said, we have a, a, a lot of international students who, who can't get here because the flights aren't, aren't running and we, we want them to start with us, so they're starting with us online. Uh, there are some students, not a great number, who, for health reasons, um, uh, for what we used to call shielding until until the UK government ended that uh, ar arrangement in August, who, who uh, are also studying with us uh, at distance. Um, but the essence of, of what we offer to most of our students, beyond the purely online degrees that we run, is that, that we provide an on-campus uh, experience uh, and we expect once transport difficulties are, are out of the way that students should uh, attend. Now that, that could change if we move into a higher level of national or local uh, measures, but that's the situation we, we are in and it's our in principle situation. Thanks for that. I'm going to um, start drawing this meeting to a close now as we're approaching four o'clock. I've uh, got Councillor Kilbane with a, a hand up and I've just got one more question I'd like to uh, put as well. I'm not seeing anybody else with hands, although Councillor Mason has just suggested perhaps a supplementary. Um, no, if you I, want I, did, to... I, I did click the raise your hand button. I'm... Oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's not come up on my on my screen. But if you if you had a question as well, I'll bring you in first, Councillor Mason, because uh, Councillor Kilbane's had a couple of questions already. But uh, over to you. I'm sorry, Charlie, it's another one for you. And obviously, with my licensing hat on, I was just thinking, how was um, how is that kind of relationship being managed? You know, traditionally, we would have seen, you know, students coming one night a week, potentially as the kind of main night, and then other nights on top of that. Obviously, with the kind of closure early, reduced transport links between um, the city and the university in terms of safe travel. I just wondered how that's kind of been managed in terms of students being able to make the most of of the city's nightlife and in a kind of ordered way. Well, one answer to that is is to walk. Um, it's it's not actually that far. Um, 
uh, and, and we are encouraging um, active travel um, also for, for, for recreational activity. Uh, I, sh I should note the facilities that we, we have built on campus for student recreational activity. Um, we, we have um, uh, three venues, two, two are extensions to, to existing ones. One is a, a completely freestanding uh, venue uh, where there is a, a very, very high level of, uh, of um, uh, safety consideration. So you, you can't get in without um, the NHS app. Uh, you, your temperature is taken on the way in. Uh, you, you have to wear a, a face mask, even though it's outside, until you reach your seat. And, and the, uh, the, the groups of six are very carefully monitored, no mixing between tables, and everything is table service. Now, we put that on um, in part so that we can cater to students um, on campus, but also in part because it's a behavioural intervention. Uh, it's, it's an educative process for how to um, enjoy yourself at, at, a, at a moment of, of public health difficulty. And we, we hope that some of the lessons learned will be taken by our students into the ways in which they, they use um, our excellent facilities uh, in town. Uh, I suspect club nights are probably off uh, for, for a while, but um, you can imagine that our students would love to have them back as soon as it's safe to do so. Thanks. I think there's more than just the students would like to have the club nights back as soon as it's safe to do to. But uh, yeah, Councillor Kilbane, uh, last quick question from you. Oh, thanks. This is um, a question for anyone who's got the answer, really. Um, of the COVID cases that we've got in the student population in York, um, how severe are they? Have we had any hospital admissions? Uh, to my knowledge, uh, no. No, I'm not aware of any serious um serious side effects that would require hospital admission. I don't know whether you're aware of anything, Nick, but I'm not. No, I, I'm not either. Um, I think, you know, th there is a bit of a lag to the, to the data and, and, and tying up um, hospital admissions to um, student status. Is, 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 is There is a bit of delay to that, but at the moment I'm not aware of anything. Thanks. So I'm um, just just a very quick last question from me and then, I, and then I'll draw the meeting to a close. Um, and I suppose it was just thinking about, obviously, um, there was the outbreak or, or, you know, a number of students in Glasgow being asked to isolate. There was, uh, I think it was, was it Northumbria, um, somewhere in the northeast where there was, a, you know, quite a significant outbreak. And I just wondered what sort of um, information sharing goes on between universities in terms of lessons that can be learned from the way that uh, outbreaks are handled in, in, in the different universities and, and uh, to what extent those conversations have, have happened uh, thus far? Uh, short answer, a lot. Um, I've certainly been in touch with my counterparts in some of uh, some of the places you've mentioned and, and others you haven't um, because th they have been places which have managed to avoid some of the challenges we've seen uh, elsewhere. And I think that uh, both, both kinds of example hold good lessons for us. Uh, and I should say also my colleagues with particular functional responsibilities uh, are also in touch with counterparts in, in other universities in order to, to, to learn uh, what works uh, and also what not to do. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I will uh, just leave me to, uh, to thank everybody for uh, attending today. Thanks particularly uh, to Charlie Jeffrey and, and to Sharon Stoltz and to Nick Sinclair. Um, I think that's been a really productive afternoon's uh, meeting. Um, if I can just remind committee members um, just to be thinking about any sort of KPI type information that we might want um, Sharon to bring back to any future meetings, any uh, of that sort of finer detail. Um, and otherwise, I will see everybody uh, who is attending this evening's meeting at uh, half past five in the um, pre-meet at five o'clock. And uh, that uh, is the end of that. And <laughs> can't quite get my words out to say goodbye to everybody, but uh, thank you very much and, and good afternoon.